Well, there you are. How's the greatest church in the world doing today? Oh, man, we, we so appreciate you th- uh, for tuning in, and thank you so much for giving us some time today. And we were so hoping to be able to see many of you in person today as well as online. And on Tuesday morning, can I tell you, I woke up at 2 in the morning, couldn't go back to sleep, was back at the office by 4.30 because uh, uh, I said, man, I think we're going to get a chance to see everybody and uh, get a chance to hang out together. But as we learned later on, our state doesn't meet the guidelines for churches to gather yet. And so today, what, uh, before we get into the message, I want to announce what our weekly worship plan is for the foreseeable future until we can all gather uh, live as well as online. We're going to broadcast all of our weekend services at the same time, uh, Saturdays at 5, at 8 o'clock, 9, 15, 10, 30, and 11, 45. But we're going to be adding some things, okay? On Monday nights, every one of you that have children, first through sixth grade, I want to encourage you, tune in all of our, uh, all of our channels from Facebook Live to YouTube and, um, and our app, uh, our website, all of these are going to be showing Coastal Kids live, okay? So here's what we're wanting to do. I want to encourage you. Make this your family like devotion time on, on Monday nights, okay? Seven o'clock, it's gonna be incredible. And let me let you know something. Even after the quarantine is lifted, our Coastal Kids Online Live is here to stay on Monday nights. This is gonna be a great feature. But some of you are like, man, that's awesome because we've got, we've got messages on uh, Monday through Friday at seven o'clock in the morning and at five o'clock. And then we got worship at, uh, at noon. But wait, let me tell you, there's more, all right? Uh, I kind of sound like an infomercial guy. Uh, uh, Pastor Steve on Wednesday night, our very own Baymanette Campus Pastor. He is going to be doing a midweek uh, service message for you at 7 o'clock there. So here's one of the, where all of us can continue to, uh, in our walk with Jesus, with this new schedule. Let me let you know something. Even in quarantine, every one of us can grow in our relationship with God, all right? And so uh, that's what I love so much about this thing, uh, that we can grow at a pace that before all of this started was kind of unheard of. Amen? All right, so it's going to be great. And I can't help but wonder today, what if this, what if this quarantine was a tool that God was going to use to launch his church further? Man, that's, a, that's an incredible thought right now. So I want you to grab your Bible and a notepad as we go into the message time. And as you're getting all this ready, let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for the truth of your word. And Lord, even though we, there are so many of us that would normally be in the house today, my prayer is that you would be even bigger than the internet, that the presence of God would fill every room, every computer screen, TV, telephone right now. Lord, we wanna hear from you. We wanna be challenged and changed by you forever. And so I just ask that over these next few moments, that you'd hide me behind your cross so that you could be lifted up and draw all people to yourself and for all the fruit that's born. We'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen. Every summer, we like to take a break from our topical series that we normally do, and we just break down a book of the Bible. And this fall, I began to feel for some reason that God wanted us to study the book of Exodus, all right? I had no idea what God was preparing us for, but it goes to show you that God certainly does have a huge sense of humor, doesn't he, all right? So for at least the next three months, we're gonna be studying this book and you are gonna love it, all right? Uh, If this is your first time uh, with us, with this series, uh, every summer we even do homework, all right, it's voluntary, of course, but you can, uh, you can click on the tab on our website, coastalchurch.tv. There'll be a tab that says Exodus Homework, and every day you can spend some time with God learning more about what we're talking about and kind of take the conversation uh, deeper. You and I are going to learn so much together, all right? So today we're going to talk about the big ideas and the, and the themes and the lessons from Exodus and see how God is 
preparing us to encounter him in a, in a new and profound way, all right? Because here's what I want to show you. The closest word to Exodus in our English language is the word exit, which means to step away and to step towards, okay? And this, this rings true now more than ever where we can say that God has delivered us from something that would harm us and bring us into something better for us, okay? If, that is, if you, are, or you are a child of God, a Christ follower, that is your story. God rescued me from sin and delivered me into a, a life where we, you and I are literally born again. We're experiencing new life in him. And many of us cannot wait until God delivers us physically from being trapped in our house, all right? We've been delivered from sin. We need to be delivered from quarantine, all right? But the book of Exodus is a book about moving forward with our lives. And so Exodus is where God takes us from one place and brings us into another place that's a better place for us. And that's the promise of God for each and every one of us. You know, it's a, Exodus is a book where we move towards our inheritance and our destiny as God's children. And for God to deliver us into our destiny, you and I, we have to learn how to be led by him. You see, life is a constant test of our trust in God. Where you and I can later on, maybe 20 and 30 years from now, we'll say the turning point in my life spiritually, financially, emotionally, in our family was during that quarantine with God. If you and I will trust God through this time, we're going to see him in ways we never dreamt or imagined. In Exodus, here's what we learn. God's people are moved from fear to trust, but it's only on a temporary basis. But you and I, we learn this huge thing now more than ever. Listen to me. In Exodus, there's this huge lesson that teaches us, and it says this. The lesson of Exodus is for us to begin to look at our fears within the context of a God that loves us, okay? You see, Exodus is all about developing our trust in God, and he proves over and over and over again that he can be trusted. Now, every year when we do our summer series, we tend to alternate one, one year we'll be doing a, a book on the Old Testament. Next, book we'll, next year we'll do something on the New Testament. And for some of us who are like New Testament folks, oh man, I, I always like learning about the New Testament. Here's what you're going to find about the book of Exodus. There is no Old Testament book that is closer to Jesus than Exodus. Some of you are like, for real? In the book, it is what I like to call, it's the Jesus book of the Old Testament where Exodus prepares us for Jesus to come on the scene. Let me give you a couple of examples. When Jesus, is fam uh, when Jesus is born, his family takes asylum in Egypt because Herod is waiting to kill him. And just like God calls his people out of Egypt in the book of Exodus, we also see that God calls his son out of Egypt back to Israel. Matthew 2.15 says this, out of Egypt I called my son. All right, Jesus, if you study the scriptures, we even see that Jesus is crucified on the very weekend where the Jews celebrate their liberation of, of, of Egypt. It's called the Passover. All of this process fits perfectly, okay? So we're gonna break down some of, the, uh, some of the, uh, the scriptures in the first chapter of the book of Exodus that sets the whole tone for the book of Exodus, all right? The first thing, I want you to write this down, that we learn in the first, uh, first very few verses of the book of Exodus is this, is that God always keeps his word. Now, let's do a little bit, bit of background here. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. The book before Exodus is the book of Genesis, okay? And in Genesis, we see that God makes promises to a man by the name of Abram. God tells this guy, Abram, I want you to leave your country, go to a land that I'm going to show you. And he gives him promises to kind of incentivize Abram so that Abram would develop a life of trusting God and God would do what he said. Let me show you what it says right here. It says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country to your people and to your father's household to the land that I will show you. And here, look at this promise he makes him. He said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So Abram learned to trust God as a young man. And as a result, his life is mega blessed. 
okay? He is wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. He has influence and stature. And what's so really cool that we see in the book of Genesis, we see that Abraham is such a baller that he even has his own army of people to protect him and his flocks and his lambs and, and his nephew and his wife, all right? And so here's what we see. Getting toward the end of his life, God has kept his word to uh, Abram and everything that he says, everything has come true, but one thing is delayed. Abram doesn't have a family yet. And one day in talking with God, uh, uh, God and, and, and Abram are having this conversation and Abram's like, look, should I give all this wealth to a guy that's kind of like my son? Not necessarily my son, he's just kind of like my son. He served me so much. Is that what you meant whenever you talked about that you were gonna, you were gonna make a great nation out of me? And God said, no, the guy that I wanna, uh, that's not the guy that I wanna give this to. Now, I'm, he's a good guy. I'm gonna bless him for the way that he's, he served you. But you're gonna, have a, you're gonna have a child that's gonna come from your own body, all right? Then the Bible says this, that God took Abram outside and he said, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. And then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. And when God tells him all this, the only problem is Abraham's in his 80s and in his 90s and he has no reason to believe in himself at all, all right? I don't mean to be crass, but bear in mind these are the days long before Viagra, okay? No reason to think that he's gonna be able to do anything but accept the, the body even says, the Bible even says that Abraham's body was dead. All right, come on, some of y'all you know, know what I'm talking about. Put your hand over your children's ears, but I wanna make sure that y'all know what, exactly what I'm talking about. The Bible said that Abram, even though he had no reason to believe in himself at all, he said that he believed in God's ability more than he did in his own ability. And God saw in Abram a man that had an enduring trust in him. And then Abram changes his name to Abraham. And guess what that name actually means? It means father of many, okay? And God blesses him with sons in his old age. Now, Exodus is where Genesis left off. And when Exodus begins, we see in the first five verses all the names of the sons of Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who went to Egypt, all right? The ancient rabbis actually call the book of Exodus the book of names because the first, <laughs> the first six verses actually talk about all the names of Abraham's grandkids, all right? But in verse six, we see the fulfillment of what God told Abraham, the father of the Jews' face. It says this, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Ladies and gentlemen, watch this, boys and girls. In 400 years' time, there are more than 600,000 Hebrew men over the age of 20 or older who all directly descended from Abraham. Now watch this. When you and I add women and kids, there are now over 2 million Hebrews conservatively, and they all descended from Abraham. We see here that God is fulfilling his promises that he made to, uh, that he made to Abraham and to Israel in the book of Genesis. God showed Abraham all of his kids that he can be trusted. And he's going to show Moses that he can be trusted and show all the Hebrew people that he can be trusted. Okay? This is a huge thing. God's word always comes true. The next thing that we see is this. God will always prepare us for the trouble that's ahead of us. Some of us were, <laughs> some of us were like, man, I wasn't prepared for this, for this pandemic. But after all this is over, can I tell you something? You're going to look back and you're going to see how God was preparing you all the way through this. I couldn't, I still kind of laugh and giggle at the simple fact that God was telling us in the fall that you're going to do a summer series on Exodus. Had no idea. God gave me this desire to study this, uh, this scripture even more. And I've been, I've been studying for months, had no idea we're going to be right here. God loves preparation. He has a purpose for everything. It's better to have a plan and have God change it than not have a plan and then blame God when we look clueless, right? God loves it when we plan. Proverbs 19, 21 actually says this, that many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that'll prevail. Ladies and gentlemen, God is supernatural, 
But in Scripture, we do not see a lot of spontaneity in the Bible. The God of the Bible is more purposeful than he is spectacular and spontaneous. Everything that he does has a purpose. And some well-intentioned folks may have told us, God is he's confusing. He's mysterious. Nobody can ever figure him, out, figure him out. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just throw this out there. God wants us to know him. He wants us to understand him and to develop a deep relationship with him. His character is consistent, and you and I can see patterns in the scriptures that show us who he is. But here's the thing. We also understand something, that God is so big, however, that we will never be able to fully understand him in our lifetimes. Okay, we're going to spend all of eternity and it's going to constantly be showing. He's going to be constantly showing us even more how, how amazing he is. All right. But you and I can know his nature, his character. And, and, and here's the other thing. We can also know that if you and I will learn to live the type of life that God blesses, we will always be walking hand in hand right with him. God loves to prepare us for good stuff, but he also loves to prepare us for trouble. And here again, we go back to the book of Genesis and we see God telling Abraham more than 400 years ahead of time what's going to happen to Abraham's descendants. He tells him this. He says this, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. What's God doing here? He's preparing Abraham. He's, he's preparing Abram where he will, uh, Abram will tell his kids, now listen, 400 years from now, one day this is going to happen. Y'all be ready and you tell your kids that it's coming. But this is God being a good father to his kids. He's saying you need to be ready for this. Some of us have learned some lessons in this pandemic that we will never forget, all right? Or, and possibly never abandon. I, as a germaphobe, I am more pleased with more people washing their hands than I've ever been before in my life, all right? This is a good thing, all right? So I'm like, you know what? After all this is over, keep on doing this. This is a good thing. And, uh, but you know what? I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, uh, I think I'm still always going to be a, a handshaking guy. I'm going to be a huggy, but I think it's a wait for all this thing to pass. That's just a good idea, right? Some of us have learned some financial lessons where uh, one guy told me the other day, I will always have a strong savings account and have as little a debt as possible because I'm so glad right now. God has prepared us. Thank God we got in that financial peace group and we learned how to save our money. We learned how to budget our money. And some of us are like, dude, whenever all this is over, I'm going to always be saving something. I ain't never going to get caught like this again. And some of us, we even see that we're never going to be the same spiritually again. I read a letter uh, that got posted the other day from a, a friend of mine uh, in Arkansas. And this man wrote his church and he said, I want to let you know something. I have wronged you. He said, y'all are always the first people that I called whenever I got into trouble. And you know what? I was, I was sporadic in my church attendance. I was sporadic in my giving. He goes, we'd hold our tithes for months, our mission uh, support for months. We would say we're going to check it online, but you know what? Something else would happen. And this man repented like very few. He said, from here on out, I want to let you know something. We are going to be there on Sunday morning, on Wednesday nights. We're going to be on Connect Group. He goes, you will. He goes, we're setting up auto draft for our tithes and offers. I, I, I was sitting there. I was reading. I was fighting back tears. And I posted on there. I said, salvation has come to this man's house. This man's been changed for it. So here's what we have to see. Only after it's over do we, do we seem to learn the lesson and see how God was preparing us for certain things in the days ahead. And it shows us again that God can be trusted. In the book of Exodus, you and I are going to see that God loves his people and he fights for them. Historically, we know that no other people group in recorded history has ever suffered more than the Hebrew people have suffered. But you want to know what else history shows us? We also see that those who persecuted the Jewish people, they have also suffered because they have persecuted the nation of Israel too. 
And whether it, be, whether it be the way that God judges Egypt and Babylon in the Old Testament or that God judges the nation of Germany uh, under Hitler or Stalin in modern days, God will always keep his word because Genesis 12, 3 says this, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. God actually com- compares the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 4, to a smoking furnace where they would be transformed into a mighty nation. In Exodus, God even prepares Moses where he says, you know what? You're going to go to Pharaoh and you're going to tell him, hey, we want to go. Uh, you're going to let my people go just for three days. We want to go out and celebrate. And here's the thing. God starts telling him, he goes, he's going to break his word to you. Every, he gonna try to turn the. He gonna uh, try to change the terms and everything. Nothing, is, uh, anything that he ever says, don't you listen to not one word of it because he's gonna go back on it all the time. He said, but here's what I'm gonna do. God told Moses all about this. He said, I am gonna flip the script. Instead of you asking Moses, can you leave for three days? Moses is going to ask you to leave, not for three days, but forever. And he said this, you get, not only that, not only are you going to leave here, you guys are going to leave here rich. You are owed 400 years of back pay, and you are going to collect every one of it. God prepared him for the trouble ahead and also for the blessing that was ahead, okay? And the final thing that we see in chapter 1 that sets the tone for the whole book of Exodus is this. Blessings bring problems. Some of you are like, I think I'm starting to see some of that. Think about this. You and I, over the last two months, we've been dealing with problems that come with a global economy and a technology for the, and here's the thing. We live in a day with technology and social media where we can talk to anyone in the world whenever we want. Has it been wonderful to have technology, especially like right now? Some of you are like, man, I couldn't go to church if it wasn't for, wasn't for technology. You and I, we can beam documents to Japan in nanoseconds. We can have a video chat with people in high definition anywhere. And you and I can actually predict the weather down to the minute. Hallelujah, what a day we live in. But over the last two months, we've seen the problems of a global economy, haven't we? Because it used to be <laughs> what happened in China stayed in China. But now, you want to have a global economy? You want to, want to be rich uh, beyond your wildest length? There are going to be global inconveniences that go along with a global economy. And with all the technology we have, here's what, what's led to the frustration. We've concluded that nature has been domesticated and it submits to us. And for many of us, we have seen that we have been under the delusion that we could control the world around us. And now we have painfully seen that that is not true. It has inconvenienced us, it has made us uncomfortable, and it has brought us to our knees. And we're learning more than ever. Technology won't satisfy us like relationships do. It just isn't the same. And look at Exodus chapter 1, and let's see how how their blessings brought them problems. It says this, Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt and he said, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to impress them and with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kind of work in the fields. In their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. We have to ask ourselves this question. Why does Egypt turn on Israel? I mean, they're they're free labor and they weren't causing trouble in the land. I mean, as a matter of fact, Egypt was blessed because Israel was there. But Pharaoh tells us why in verse 11. It's because they were a security risk. He thought that if there was an invasion to uh, to Egypt, Israel would side with the enemy. They were slaves in Egypt, but here's the thing. They were still blessed. How were they blessed? With kids. We're going to talk about that more next week. The greatest blessing, the greatest reward that God ever gives to his, his kids are kids. 
our babies and children. That's how we bless. And so what, what are some of the blessings that we've experienced during this quarantine, we got to ask? I'll tell you one thing that I've noticed, especially around here. There may be different where some of you are watching different parts of the world and different parts of the country. The weather around here has been breathtaking. For like eight weeks, we had like one rainy day. The colors are popping everywhere. I mean, it's just, it's been really, really cool. Um, I have more time with a family. Some of y'all would say like me, dude, we used to eat out all the time. Now, buddy, my leftover game is on point, you know? And so uh, here's the thing. The vast majority of us have been able to work from home. And for those, for the majority of us, we're still employed and healthy. And can I just bring this to you? This quarantine has been nothing more than just an inconvenience. That's the blessing of God. Look at what, here's what I'm learning that we're going to learn together in the book of Exodus. So often what we think is the battle actually isn't the battle at all. This is what we learn in Exodus. The real battle wasn't even against Egypt or Pharaoh. God will show us that the real battle began in the Garden of Eden when God told Adam, I'm going to put enmity between my people and the devil's people. And that war still goes on today. In this series, we'll spend three different weekends talking about spiritual warfare. And before we go, I want us to be ready to identify two very powerful symbols of the Holy Spirit that we're going to see in Exodus that will really change, uh, change our perspective for this season that we're in, Okay. Two symbols. The first symbol that we're going to see in the book of Exodus, fire. Fire is a picture of the Holy Spirit. For those of us that have read in the book of Acts, you saw tongues uh, of fire set upon them. When God delivers us from sin, he brings the fire of the Holy Spirit, okay? Burns away stuff. Why did God use the symbol of fire? Because all of God's symbols in the Old Testament serve as a practical function for us, okay? God sends fire, the first reason why, to purify us. As we grow in our relationship with God, the fire of the Holy Spirit burns away the things that once held us captive. Can I tell you, I've been serving Jesus for 27 years. I'm not the same person I was anymore, God's delivered me. And let me let you know something. When I talk about how God has delivered me, I'm not talking about rehabilitation. I'm talking to you about transformation. I don't even think the same way because the fire of the Holy Spirit has burned up that stuff out of my life. He's transformed my life. I look like him now because of the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit that I spend time with him daily. I begin to look more like him and what he created me to be. And that's the plan of God for all of us. And just like we see that God does with Moses, the Spirit of God calls us out of the fire and he wants to talk with us. And for those of us who are struggling with issues today, maybe you're at home and you're saying, Chad, I'm just, I'm overdoing it. I'm drinking too much. I'm, I'm swearing too much. I'm, I'm watching stuff I shouldn't watch. May you experience the fire of the Holy Spirit and may you embrace Jesus as your deliverer today. We also see that his fire, uh, that God also sends his, his fire to consume us. He wants to consume everything about us. And when he does, it draws people to him. The Holy Spirit, here's what we're going to see in the book of Exodus. The Holy Spirit shows up in the desert of Exodus like a burning bush and it drew Moses to want to look at it. But here's the thing. Burning bushes were not uncommon in the desert. What do you mean, PC? They could get so hot from the, from the sun and the lack of water that they just spontaneously combusted because it got so doggone hot. And so the, the, fi- the bush that was on fire wasn't what drew Moses over there to it. Here's what he was noticing. He's like, yeah, another one on fire. But what he noticed was this one's on fire and it's not being burned up. Can I tell you? <laughs> then it says, he, I, lo- I love how the Bible says in the, in the book, uh, uh, in the King James Version, he, it said that Moses looked and he saw, hey, well, it wasn't burned up. He said, I will go and look at this strange thing. You know, this is a picture of what the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts in the early church and what he wants to do with us today. The Holy Spirit wants to consume our hearts where he can bring the fire of God in our life without us burning out because we're consumed by his fire, not ours. 
Not our energy, not our makeup, but the passion and the fire of the Holy Spirit. And just like he did with Moses out of God's consuming fire, the Holy Spirit calls our name. And that's what he's doing for all of us today. And the final symbol that we're going to discuss is the symbol of the cloud. The cloud in the book of Exodus means this. It means God is among his people. It was the enveloping presence of the Holy Spirit. All two million of those Hebrew people knew where God's presence was. All right? And here's the thing. They said the cloud would hover over the tabernacle. They, they knew. They knew that God was there. And can I tell you, I love the way the book of Exodus ends. Near the, book of, uh, near the end, after God has spent years of feeding them supernaturally and providing water for them in, in the desert, God finally has enough with everybody but, but Moses and Aaron and Joshua. And, and, and he, his presence is grieved because there's constant complaining and negativity. You see, God delivered them out of Egypt, but, but they still had Egypt inside of them. And there's constant complaining and negativity, which shows us, ladies and gentlemen, our words create our culture. Watch what you're saying during this quarantine. It'll create the culture that's around you. And then God does something unprecedented. In chapter 33, he tells Moses, he said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my word and bless you guys, but you're not going to feel my presence again. I'm done. Taking the cloud with me. Going away. Can I let you know something? I found in my, my ministry experience and my relationship with Jesus that most Christians are just fine with that. Where, you know what, if, as long as you bless my life, as long as you provide for me, that's totally cool. I don't have to feel you. Where as long as you bless me, I don't have to feel your presence. And then you and I, it, we can so easily turn into a little bless me cult. What I believe that this pandemic has revealed to so many of us is how distracted our life can become. It's so easy to build a life around our conveniences, isn't it? We chase our hobbies and our work and our entertainment, and when they're gone, that's when we're forced to focus inwardly. We're seeing a rise in divorce right now. We're seeing a rise in addiction and alcoholism. Why? Because people are forced to look inward and they don't like what they see. But here's what Moses does, which is so powerful. God says, you know what? I'm going to bless y'all. I'm going to do everything that I told you, but you're not going to feel my, my presence anymore. And Moses refuses to go any further. He says, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't you send us another step. Moses tells God, I don't want just what you can do for me. I want you. And what Moses discovered is what my prayer's been that all of us will discover today, that we don't need more convenience or more hobbies or more money or more security. We need the presence of Almighty God on our life. We need a relationship with God that is saturated with this presence. As a new convert, I cried every week at church for months. I'm still doing it today. Why? Because his presence was melting my heart. I felt like somebody was around me all the time, even though I was all by myself. And God wants to do that again for each and every one of us. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said it this way, and it was this dying appeal, said this, the presence of God in the church will put an end to infidelity. Men will not doubt his word when they feel his presence. For a thousand reasons or more, we need the presence of Jehovah to come into the camp and deliver his people from Egypt again. Our prayer today is this. Father, would you meet with us again today? We want to be together again in one place so we can collectively feel your presence. But right now, over every wave, Lord, be bigger than the internet right now. Be bigger than Facebook Live. Be bigger than YouTube. Be bigger than all of that. And just flood us with your presence again. Our prayer is this. Give us hungry hearts for your presence again, Father. Oh, that God would make us hungry for his presence again in our church. That God would make us hungry for his presence in our marriage. Where things just aren't so tense all the time. 
His presence would be in us and on our house. And our family has a peace and gentleness. Turmoil and strife are over. Proverbs tells us that words are strife, there's pride. And today may God convict us of our pride where strife is, becomes foreign to our home. And where God shows us his glory on our home just like he did with Moses because he shows us this and it's this. God's glory is always revealed at the end of our ego. Wouldn't it be so powerful if the fire of the Holy Spirit just warmed us again to his presence? And because of Moses' commitment to God's presence, look how the book of Exodus ends. It says this. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And all the travels of the Israelites, look at this, let's repeat that. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all of Israelites during all of their travel. I know it's tough not being able to go back to life as normal anymore. But can I, can I just tell you what I'm praying right now? I don't want to ever be the same after this. When this quarantine is over, my prayer has been focused on where we could get all back together again. But you know what? I want a new power when we meet together. I want a new power right now online. I want new power on our campuses. And here's what we, be, we continue to pray. Keep us locked away until we desire your presence more than anything else in this world. I don't want our church to be the same anymore. God, and here's the thing. We're like, God, don't you dare lift this quarantine and let us go back to business as usual. Change what needs to be changed in me. Change what needs to be changed in our church. Reach the masses online and let all of us feel your presence again. I want the presence of God to mark us where every day we meet with him individually and every weekend we meet with him corporately together and people will know that we've been in the presence of God. I want you to stand right now where you are and I want you to lift your hands with me and let's begin to call on the presence of the Lord. Father, right now, for my brothers and sisters, Lord, who, who are watching all over, all over our area and Lord, even some of them all over the world and all over our country, would you right now give us a passion for your presence like never before? Lord, change things in us. Lord, may all this, all this strife and the pride and envy just stop. Melt it away. Lord, your word says that the hills melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Melt it all away again. Give us a heart to know you again. Change us, God. Don't let us go back to ever being the same again. May we get to know you this summer. May we get to know you in this quarantine in ways that we never dreamt or imagined. Fill us with your presence so that in every way we can say your presence is enough. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Before we go, there are some of you today who say, Pastor Chad, I don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you one time served God and you've drifted and fallen away. You're like all throughout this, all throughout this broadcast, Man, something's been pulling on me. Let me tell you what that is. That's the presence of God. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the God that created you that wants to have a relationship with you. And you can begin one here in just a few seconds. I want you to pray this prayer after me. We're all going to pray this prayer together. After you do, I want you to fill out that Connect card online. Let us know that you prayed that prayer. We want to get started with you in your relationship with God. But all of us, you're part of the family of God now. We're all going to pray this prayer with you. Pray this prayer with me out loud. Dear Lord Jesus. You know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm a sinner, and I've committed sins. But today, Lord Jesus, I give you those sins. I ask you to come into my heart, wash me clean, and I'll live for you as you show me how. In Jesus' name, amen. If today you prayed that prayer, please make sure that you let us know about it. We want to get started with you. We want to coach you up and love you. Hey, church, I sure love you. 
I miss you with all my heart, but thank God we can connect together with technology. You are the greatest church in the world. I'm so honored to be your pastor. If, if this message has been in any way of value, do you want to encourage you to share it with some of your friends? Let's keep believing God. Let's keep connecting with him. Do your homework this week and learn more about what we're going to be discovering in the book of Exodus. And I'm just believing for God to continue to show himself strong and mighty on your behalf. And we'll see you next week right here in Coastal. God bless.